As a young man of only 19, he wrote Knights in White Satin and secured his place in music history for himself and his band, the Moody Blues. The album, Days of Future Past, went on to become a classic, and there's been no stopping since. More hits, including Tuesday Afternoon, more solo projects, and the Moody Blues continue to perform today to sold-out crowds across the globe. Hello, I'm Ernie Minus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with chart-topping lead singer of the Moody Blues, Justin Hayward. Do you find that there's a big difference between when you sit down to write something, writing for a solo project as opposed to writing for something the Moody Blues is going to do? I don't think so, but there is at the end what I'm writing because I can probably say things in a solo project that, um, that maybe are not appropriate to say with the whole group, you know, so I can express maybe more personal opinions, but um, there probably is. The, in the method or the way I think about it, no. Yeah. Songwriting is such a, a unique, it's like having a room in your house where nobody else can go. It's a sort of <laughs> world of imagination. I always yeah. think my life would be rather sad if I wasn't a songwriter, you know, it's just slightly disturbing. Is it hard to write a song? Yeah. Is it something that is difficult? I, I heard Nights in White Satin you wrote in five minutes. Well, I, the basic song, because I just came home one night and sat on the side of the bed and um, and I just did the basic song, and it wasn't until I took it into the rehearsal room the next day that I played it two nights to the other guys, and they went sort of, hmm, what going? But then <laughs> <laughs> Mike Pinder, well, Mike Pinder said, Let's play it again. So I went, Nights in White Sunday, went da 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 on the Mellotron, and it seemed to make sense, and then everybody was interested. Nights in White Satin. Never reaching the end Letters I've written Never meaning to send Beauty I'd always missed With these eyes before Just what the truth is I can't say But do all songs come that easily? No, it's, um, you know, if I may quote Picasso, I think he said, inspiration has to find you working. Yeah. So I'm not, unfortunately, one of those guys who can just walk around writing things on pieces of paper and then collecting up those pieces of paper and it'll work. Oh, for me, it's a, it's a question of, uh, you know, 5% inspiration and then 95% work, really, at it. Yeah, I was talking with, a, with an author who said that he writes every single day. Oh. Whether it's good or bad, well, that's a great he will discipline. sit down and write, and then mm -hmm. he can throw it away if he has to, but he always is writing to keep it going. As a songwriter, mm -hmm. do you find you're writing, when, when there are periods that you are doing writing, do you find you write in a consistent period and then certain things rise to the top, or is everything you write possibly going to be on an album, going to be a song? That's, that's a great question, because I'm such a lazy person that <laughs> <laughs> I need some kind of focus and deadline. And uh, in the old days, in the early days with the Moody Blues, the guys were always expecting me to come up with something first, so I'd have my songs ready for an album. Um, nowadays, I think, when I put my mind to it, I can write as much as I want to. Yeah. But there's a lot that goes on in life, you know, life isn't always just about work and doing and songwriting you know uh, that's that that that's w what I do creatively but um, so when I devote time to it it'll it'll happen and I know that yes wow that's it that fascinates me that you can that in something that is so creative and such a mm -hmm. part of almost the soul when it comes out yeah. that you can actually structure in a way that you know when the period is right the music will come it's if if I sit down with a guitar and start to play, something will happen. It's yeah. just getting me to sit down <laughs> with the guitar. Do you find at this point in your career that, that when you sit down to play, 
you're playing things you've already written before. Do you ever hear it coming back like, wait, I already did that one? I think every gut guitar player returns to certain phrases that they learn when they're a child and um, that they return to in particular guitar riffs. And you build a kind of style. And it's probably built between the ages of 13 and 25. Yeah. And then uh, it's a question of leaning on that and, uh, and, and using that. But um, w whether I return and write the same song, no. I, in fact, um, the biggest problem for me in the Moody's was in the early days when people were saying, can't you just write another Nights in White Satin? <laughs> <laughs> and that cleared up once I'd done um, a Story in Your Eyes and, and Question and those kind of things. Why do we never get an answer when we're knocking at the door with a thousand million questions about hate and death and war? But when we stop for love around us, there is nothing that we need in a world of persecution that is burning in its grief. Does it surprise you nights came so early in your career? Well, none of us were expecting that. None of us were thought it could ha have a hope in hell as a single. Yeah. And um, just it so it people know, you were 19 when you. Yes, wrote that I was 19 yeah. when I wrote it. Yeah, I was 20 when we recorded it, and we recorded it first for the BBC, the um, British Broadcasting Corporation, a long time bef before we recorded it on the album. But um, none of us thought that it had any. Uh, none of us thought it had any high hopes for the uh, the whole album. Really, <laughs> we just got lucky that American radio was, FM radio was being born, and our stuff was so beautifully recorded. It was perfect for that uh, medium. I and think that album came about because you guys. Now I'm going to say it poorly, mm. but had a debt to pay off. That you yes. were going to work for them, and you were going to create right. an album so that they could publicize their new sound that was the symphonic sound they were trying to do. Yes. Instead, you wrote a classic. Did I? I yes, you <laughs> did. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, I don't know about that. But uh, yes, we had a debt to them. And um, they wanted, they had a consumer division, de Decca, where they wanted to sell their stereo machine. They wanted to to demonstrate that stereo could be as interesting for rock and roll as it was for classical music. They owned the second largest classical catalog masters in the world after Deutsche yeah. Grammophon. And in fact, a few years after that, they came together and now it's one big universal that does own all the great classical masters. Yeah. I often look at the Moody Blues kind of in the same way I look at Fleetwood Mac, is that they had a period of time and then they brought in some new blood into mm. the band and it changed the direction, it changed everything for mm -hmm. them. And what you did when you went into that band, I'm wondering if you thought after you first went in there before, nights before that album came, mm -hmm. had you made the right move? Did you ever question it? I think all of us, in truth, were just living day by day, seeing what was going to happen. Nobody knew the possibilities. It was, uh, we were all so young and um, we, di we didn't have any worries or responsibilities. Or well, we had worries because we yeah. had to eat, but not <laughs> responsibilities. So we could go home and live with our parents, which is, a matter of fact, what I did around the time of the recording of Days of Future Past. We didn't have any money then, and I was just still trying to pay off the payments on my guitars and amplifiers. But um, none of us knew. And, but I came to the Moody Blues as a writer determined to do my songs. And um, I knew that it was it had it had had a very successful year as a rhythm and blues band, but mm -hmm. the lead singer who was great at that rhythm and blues had l blues had left, mm -hmm. and um, the rest of us that were left after the two guy the bass player and the original bass player and the original guitar player left weren't that great at, <laughs> at rhythm <laughs> and blues, but I could write and Mike could write and uh, that was the foundation that we built on. Tuesday afternoon I'm just beginning to see now I'm on my way It doesn't matter to me chasing the clouds away Something 
Eventually, you take a break from the movies in 74 or so. Yes. And I wonder, at that time, did you feel a freedom to go and be yourself, or was there still a commitment to trying and keep that feeling, that sound alive? Um, I've never, I, I've luckily been free of the pressures of A&R people or telling me what I should do, so I always just trusted my own judgment and did what I wanted to do. Luckily enough, I was with a record company called Decca, who in those early days just said, do what you want. We How have did no you end idea. up in that position? So many because artists didn't have that freedom. Because of Days of Future Past, because Days of Future Past, there was a lot of people. We, we can't claim that it was our idea. It was a amalgamation of, it was a, a project by a lot of people within Decca, and it was, a gr it was a great project. But after that, nobody quite knew why it had happened. So what Decca had was, fantastically staffed recording studios with beautiful recording quality and they just said to us listen just do what you want here's the studio time just do what you want and I got used to that and you never yeah. that's something you never want to be without you imagine if you boys and girls could just do what you wanted <laughs> all the time without some executive producer telling you what to do yeah wonderful child in a candy glorious. store almost yes it was wonderful yeah absolutely as you progress in your solo career, yes. do you do work that you think sounds more Moody's than you, or is there never that separation for you? Um, there's, there's only, uh, no, there's never the separation for me, no. Okay. I, I'm, I, I've always been, I've been determined to do exactly the songs that I want to do and make my own mistakes and, and be responsible for it. <laughs> and. Um, I, I, and I'm very happy if people want to share that, but yeah. I'm still going to stick to my own guns and um, uh, and do what I want. Hard yeah. when the group comes back together, then. What in what way? And well, the, the now you have granted they're never yeah. separate, but you're on your own path, doing yes. your own work, and then the mm -hmm. Moody's say, "Let's get back together. Let's continue." Now, of course, during that time, you do work with a lot of those members. Yeah. Okay. So it's not like. A lot of groups that split up because there's uh, anger. Oh and they no. All different no, 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 no. There's yeah. nothing said that can't be unsaid, which was uh, luckily for us that in the 70s too, that wasn't the case of a big bust up. But um, no, I, I think that um, whatever each one of us does outside the band, here we are talking about the Moody Blues. It's always good for the Moody's and reminds people about that. Yeah. And the Moody's is such a vast catalogue that we did together. that are left are representing that catalogue and rediscovering things that we only ever worked on for maybe a day or two in the studio at the time. <laughs> That's the way yeah. the recording was and, and a lot of those things we never did on the stage. And I think this is the best incarnation of the Moody's that I'm in now. But this is a stage version now, the touring Moody Blues. Right. And it produces those songs faithfully uh, as they really were with the right spirit and the right feeling and with the right people singing them, yeah. the original people singing them. My own thing is is like my own life you know I, I'm not I'm not a guy in a group I, I'm we're all individuals with our own lives and going our own way we live in completely different places yeah. when we come together we sound like that but I also have it in me to have a need to do things that are quite different and do exactly what I want to do. I can do that within the Moody's context, but it wouldn't be fair, I don't think, to get into the habit of just making solo records and calling them Moody Blues records, which is right. what will happen, which was ha has happened. Yeah. When you're out as just you, mm -hmm. is the experience going out, seeing people, your audience reaction, is it different than you going out as part of the Moody's? Yes, it is. I mean, this... Um, this I brought 
my show, I've brought all my own acoustic guitars from home. And my, they, you know, they're seeing the world too. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a different, it's as I wrote these songs. Yeah. It's as I wrote them, before I started arranging them or putting lots of overdubs on them or anything like that. So Which brings up an interesting yes. point, and I just want to jump back a little, yeah. is that I heard that you went back and remastered the masters of the Moody's for did, yeah. digital recordings, because when yeah. they first went to CD, they quickly put them out, and they didn't really pay attention. No. They, were, they went, there was such a rush to go to the digital domain from the vinyl um, domain, really, that it w they were transferred into the digital domain very badly. Uh, everybody's records, I must right. say, not just the Moody's. And so when it was only when Universal kind of appointed me the gatekeeper of this great catalogue, which is very time consuming, and uh, I've mixed, remixed a lot of things for them, <laughs> that I realized that they were, um, that they weren't good enough. They weren't as good as the vinyl right. masters, the digital ones weren't as CD ones. And I was lucky that I was in Italy recording at the studio that I uh, made the spirits of the western sky out and there was a S moody blue super fan there who bought <laughs> I'd heard two, this story two I think copies this is of amazing. every uh, he bought two copies of every vinyl album that we'd ever done one that he played and one that he'd never opened and the uh, uh, we ha uh, my engineer in in, uh, in italian of course he asked him graciously in italian if we could play for the first time the ones that he'd never opened and this was a huge, <laughs> sad, bittersweet moment for this man. And so he had to stand while we ceremonially, <laughs> was, uh, you know, a kind of slashed open the, uh, the cling film and, and played <laughs> them. And, uh, right, and we were able to hear them for the first time on, uh, on Virgin because well, the label didn't have any. No one else had any. Did they sound different to you? Yes. Really? Yeah, and so I made a, my mission then and purpose to go back to the original um, vinyl two-track master. There was one great difference that it stand, stood out a mile. It was on a track called um, Legend of a Mind. It's Timothy Leary's death, no, 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 he's outside. Timothy Leary's death, no. And there's a ride symbol of Graham's that I always loved, and I always asked him to do it on recordings. And on the on the digital version, it always sounded like tick, 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 tick. And I thought, well, it was just a bad day. The engineer had a bad day. On the vinyl, it sounds immaculate. Really? And so that was my starting point. Let's go back to that, yeah. I also had the uh, quad version mixes that were done in the 60s. So I could hear the echoes, and I could hear everything I could hear the four track ver yeah. original four track versions so now are you happy with the digital mixes that are out there <laughs> I don't know because <laughs> you couldn't leave them in that same vinyl state you right. because everybody's I know this sounds bizarre but everybody's ears and the way they hear music is different now they expect some compression they expect it to be more in your face right it, it can't be like it was um, sort of in in the background to at least try and compete with uh, other um, recordings, you have to process them somehow in a modern way, yeah. in, a, in, in, a, in a way for the 21st century. You can't stay in that 60s mode. I've also heard there's a difference in the ear between Europe and America, that Europeans so. will have a little higher pitch they're comfortable with, Americans like it a little smoother. Maybe it has something to do with the way the women <laughs> scream <laughs> or something, you know. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> I don't know. You hit stronger in the U.S., in America first, and then kind of trickled back to the U.K., correct? Well, we were always making a living in the U.K., just about scraping by, and in Europe and in France, we had huge success. We were, um, uh, Nights was number one when it was first released in France, and after we played live at the Medem Festival up there. And, but then we came to America as support act for a lot of other people. We came and supported a group. Uh, called Canned Heat, who took us right across America. We supported The Cream on their first well tour, first uh, well uh, farewell tour. We, uh, uh, supported? No, that's a, that's an English word. Uh, we uh, we were the opening, opening act, act yeah. for these people, and 
all the other all the other English groups, almost without exception, weren't prepared to do that. They're saying we're stars. We're you know we're ch we're in the charts. We're stars. But we won't go on as an opening act for anybody. <laughs> we we didn't care at all, and that was the making of us. Yeah. We just went. We'd open up for it. We were quite disappointed when we got to a gig and found out that we were top of the bill. <laughs> Normally, we could be back in the hotel by nine o'clock or on the bus. <laughs> well, sorry, success hit you, and what are you going to do? Yes, you know. Now, <laughs> then you took a period of time where you hadn't recorded for a little bit, and now you've yes. come out with a new, a new album of your own work. Yes. Why the time between solo projects, and what made you decide this was time to come back? I had so many songs. I could not see a new Moody Blues album on the horizon looming, and I had a lot of work that I wanted to do, and I had a lot of things in my heart that needed to be said. I couldn't just keep them to myself. And I was in the studio working a lot for Universal and for the Moody's, mixing DVDs, remastering, um, doing a, 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 a lot of different stuff, the 5.1 surround sound, and constantly working in the studio, my engineer would say, you've got all these demos, you know, let's do them properly. Yeah. And um, we started to do them properly, then it became my whole life, then a labor of love, and um, Spirits of the Western Sky expresses exactly what I am, more than anything I've ever done, and I mean anything that I've ever done before. Upside down and inside out Repeatedly defeated, I've been messed about Kicked in the head and out of bed Kicked into believing it was something that I said But oh, tomorrow things will change But tonight I think I'm gonna drown my sorrows again There's a maturity about it now where I'm able to speak um, in a, it, I, I'm able to think about what I'm saying and uh, to n not consider uh, anything else. And I found that, um, you know, it, it's, uh, I have to express the love that I have for people around, acquaintances and friends and people that I've kind of fallen in and out of love yeah. with around. And I'm very much aware of, of my own, of the way things are moving through life and that when I find someone that inspires me or I want to be with, then I really have to change my life and be with them. And um, that's expressed in this album. So this is the truest expression of, uh, of, of me as a person. Yeah. Do you know what it is in you that makes you feel the need to share this? Why ah. you? <laughs> that's, a that's an interesting thing, Ernie, because that's a kind of, that's a, almost a duty. Yeah. If somebody's prepared to, to, to put Thirteen ninety nine down, or whatever, twelve ninety nine, or whatever it is, or buy a ticket, and it makes them happy, and it's it's a nice, warm feeling. Then I I I have a kind of duty to do it, whether I kind of want to or not. Yeah. In and facing the world with an empty diary would be awful. <laughs> yes. yeah. In your real life, in your outside of your yeah. showbiz life. Yeah. Have you unburdened yourself also? Do you feel the same point in your real personal life as you do in your creative artistic life? Ah, no, that's a thing. Well, um, that's that's something that has to be expressed through my professional life, I suppose, because it's not I, 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 my personal life is is just that my own beliefs and my own faith are just that, and they're they're mine, and. Um, that's the thing that I'm still searching and seeking about, really. Yeah. And uh, I realize now that a lot of things aren't forever. They're for now. A lot of the places where I am are for now. They're not particularly forever. Yeah. So um, I'm avoiding your question <laughs> like mad. <laughs> well, but, um, let me ask this way, then. That's my business. Do really you just really. find that your life and your, and your public career yeah. parallel, or are they not related? No. They're not, no, they're not related. It's a different person. Is it a conscious separation between the no, two? No, 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 it isn't. It's, the, it's the, the songwriting and the music is a kind of mystery that I don't intend to analyze that much. Yeah. It's as simple as that. And so um, there's no intention to keep them separate. Only in the fact that I've never enjoyed that kind of um, 
rock star lifestyle and, and wouldn't, have, wouldn't have chosen that. There was a moment, I think, in the late 60s where we could have chosen to become celebrities and um, But you made a conscious effort to keep yourselves out of it and let the We music never smiled until about 1979 <laughs> <laughs> in a photograph, you know. So. Well, we're happy you're smiling today. We're happy oh, you're with us, pleasure. still making great music. And oh, it's thank a you very much. You're very kind. You're very kind. Thank you very much, boys and girls. And thank you, Ernie, for your, your all the nice things that you've said. It's been a real pleasure. Well, an honor speaking with you, Justin Hayward. Thank you. Never reach in the end Letters I've written Never mean to say Beauty I've always been With these eyes before Just what the truth is